Jesus, what a friend for sinners, Jesus, lover of my soul. Welcome to the Unknown Bible, the broadcast ministry of Bible Believers Baptist Church in Corpus Christi, Texas. Join us now for today's Bible study with our pastor, Bevins Welder. You know, the question comes up today pretty frequently when you're talking to people about salvation. The question that comes up is this, is repentance necessary for salvation? And there are debates about all that. You know, if you read the Bible, there's no debate. Repentance is necessary for salvation. I mean, there's no question that the Lord demands repentance. Look in 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3. In 2 Peter chapter 3, the Bible says, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now notice what He said. Not willing that any should perish, but that how many? All should come to repentance. You know, when Jesus described one of the purposes of his earthly ministry, one of the reasons for his coming, he said, well, turn to Matthew chapter 9, verse 13, and you can read what he said. In Matthew chapter 9 and verse 13, you know, Jesus was questioned about hanging around with sinners. Here's what he said. In Matthew chapter 9, he said, verse 13, Go you and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And what has he come to call them to do? He said, I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You see, the, the Pharisees had asked the question, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? And the Lord answered, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. They that are sick in this are sinners, and sinners he calls to repentance. In Luke chapter 13, again, in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, Luke chapter 13, look with me in verse 3. Jesus said, I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Now, you know something? The Lord could have written volumes of books that would really occupy every space in the world, according to John. And Jesus Christ was talking about some Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices, and Jesus asked this question. He said, suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things. Then he says to them, I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Or those 18 upon whom the power and the tower in Siloam fell and slew them. Think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem. I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Isn't that interesting? Now I realize that there are other verses in there that talk about salvation, but notice the times that Jesus Christ spoke of the need to repent uh, and the long-suffering of the Lord that all should come to repentance. In describing what goes on in heaven when a soul gets saved, you know what the Lord said in Luke chapter 15? Turn there. In Luke chapter 15, the Lord said in verse 10, Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner, one sinner, that repenteth. You know, <laughs> that's interesting. Over one soul that repenteth. I, you know, you're saying, well, shouldn't he have said 
uh, over one sinner that gets saved? Well, he said it twice in verse 7. He said the same thing. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. More than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. You see, <laughs> when Paul described his evangelistic preaching in Acts chapter 20 and verse 21, when he's talking to the elders at Ephesus, look what he says. Acts chapter 20. At verse 21, Paul says this, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, there must be faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That if thou shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. But there's also repentance. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the word repent, or some variation of the word repent, shows up in the Bible 112 times. The first time that this word appears in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. So let's go there. Because now we're going to try to find out, you know, what does he mean, repent, and what's the significance of repentance? Well, in Genesis chapter 6, look at verses 6 and 7. Uh, 5 gives us the context. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Well, you can see from this context that here, repentance is clearly defined as a change of mind. The Lord was grieved with the wickedness of men in the earth, and he repented that he had made man. And as a result of his repentance, he destroyed them with a flood. In other words, watch it, he took action on what he decided. In other words, repentance is a change of mind, but that change of mind leads to an action. Let's look at it again in Exodus chapter 13. This is the next time that we see the word repent or repentance in Exodus chapter 13. Look at verse 17. All right, in Exodus chapter 13. 13 and verse 17 the bible says it came to pass when pharaoh had let the people go that god led them not through the way of the land of the philistines although that was near for god said lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to egypt now what's he saying well when israel left um egypt they didn't go straight across along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea because it would have taken them through the land of the Philistines. The Lord turned them south on the west side of the Red Sea and then had them cross over the Red Sea miraculously much further south. Why? Because he said when, if they get into the land of the Philistines and they see war, they're going to repent and they're going to turn around and return to Egypt. All right, so you notice then that repentance there indicates a change of mind and then a change of direction. The Lord was concerned that Jews would change their mind about going to the promised land and that they would change direction and return to Egypt. Later, when Aaron made the golden calf, you know, the Lord was ready to destroy the Jews and start over with Moses. But Moses interceded for the Jews. And so, you know what the Lord did? He changed his mind. Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32, verse 12, Moses is pleading with the Lord. He said, wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say for mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidest unto them, I will multiply your seed, 
as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. So the Lord repented, and the Lord decided not to destroy them. So repentance, as you can see from Genesis 6 and Genesis uh, or excuse me, Exodus chapter 13 and Exodus chapter 32. Repentance is clearly a change of mind. And that change of mind results in a change of action or an action that results in a change. The action, the action that results from the repentance demonstrates that the mind of the person who has repented has definitely changed. For example, let me just completely out of the context of spiritual things. Uh, let's say there's a man who um, puts in an offer, you know, he accepts an offer from a company to go to work for them. And they say, all right, do you want to come work for us? And they go through the interview process and all that. And he said, yes, I will work for you and I will start one month from today. Two weeks Two weeks before he's to report from work, he changes his mind. He decides that he's either received a better offer or he doesn't want to leave the company that he's working for or that there's something wrong with the company that he's getting ready to go to work for. And he decides, I'm not going to work for them. After he changes his mind, you know what he does? He doesn't show up for work 30 days from the date that he accepted that job. He goes somewhere else. In other words, he changes his mind, which results in an action that changes his direction. You see, in the New Testament, when Paul says that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance, you know, he says this in Acts chapter 26, so why don't you turn there. Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26, and look at verse 20. The, uh, what Paul is doing is he's speaking before Agrippa, and he's explaining um, what he has done in the ministry and why he shouldn't be locked up. And so Agrippa is listening, and as Paul talks about the heavenly vision, he says, I showed first, in Acts chapter 26, verse 20, I showed first unto them of Damascus, and at Jerusalem, and throughout all the coast of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. When you, re when you read that passage of Scripture, you know what you're not reading? You're not reading that repentance is a work. Although some people argue that repentance can't be a necessary part of salvation because repentance is a work. Repentance is not a work. They repent, they turn to God, and then they do works meet for repentance. You know what the word meet means? It's a match. In other words, what Paul is saying is that if there is real repentance in the heart or real repentance in the mind, eventually there will be evidence that the person has truly changed his mind because he will change what he's doing. The works that he starts doing after his repentance are going to match the repentance. They're not going to match the sin that he was committing before he repented. Do you see it? There'll be a change. Works meet or that match the repentance. Uh, that's the way repentance is used in the context where it appears in the Bible. Somebody changes his mind, and then what he does reflects to everybody else that his mind has changed. Listen, in John chapter 16, verses 8 through 11, you know what happens? The Holy Spirit comes to reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Turn to John chapter 16. In John chapter 16, the Holy Spirit comes and the Bible says, when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. That's the sin that will get you. 
failure to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. So the Holy Spirit has to reprove you of righteousness because you can't visibly see the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He has ascended into heaven. And of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. And he needs to reprove you of that to let you know, if you keep going the way you're going without Christ, you're going to be reproved, you're going to be judged with the devil. And the devil is going to the lake of fire, and that's where you're headed if you don't repent. <laughs> All right, so the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin. And in the process of convicting you or reproving you of sin and of righteousness, you know what he reveals to you? That what you thought was righteousness in your life is really unrighteousness. It's like Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6 says. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6 says, we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. You know, when you talk to somebody about the Lord Jesus Christ, and there's no repentance, you know what they do? They profess their own goodness. You know what they do? They tell you that, uh, I've never hurt anybody. I'm doing the best that I can. I love my fellow man. Um, I go to church. You know, they, they start running down. They start looking at the things that they expect that God expects of them based upon their limited understanding of the Bible and very limited understanding of the Ten Commandments. And they say, you know, based on all of that, I, I must be all right. I believe I believe I, I believe God let me into heaven. Uh, I surely want to go there. You know what the problem is? They, they haven't they don't have a real they don't have a real honest appraisal of their own lives from a biblical perspective from a holy spirit perspective from god's perspective at all and you know so when the holy spirit uh, reproves you of sin and of righteousness he reveals your unrighteousness and like in isaiah 64 you say you know what i'm as an unclean thing all my righteousnesses are as filthy rags in other words the best that i can do is filthy and when you see that when the holy spirit shows your unrighteousness to you you know what he expects he expects you to repent like job did you look at yourself and you say you know what i thought i was good but i'm vile in other words that is you change your mind about your own righteousness and recognize that your sin and your unrighteousness will wind you up in hell you see until a sinner comes to that place what's the use of getting saved I talked to a fellow one time, I'd visited with him many times in the nursing home, and he said he'd been a Christian all his life. I said, well, that's an interesting thing, because the Bible talks about being saved, and you know, you think of a fireman saving you out of a fire, or a, life, a lifeguard saving you from drowning in the pool. What, what were you facing by way of tragedy or eternal condemnation, whereby you can say you're saved today? And he goes, well, I never have faced that. I have never on my way to hell. And we started talking about the Bible. And you know what the Spirit of God did? He reproved him. And that man saw his own unrighteousness. And he saw that he was lost. And you know what he did? He repented and he trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior. He changed his mind about his eternal status and realized he was lost and not saved. And the guy got saved. You see... <laughs> When you, when you change your mind and recognize that your sin and your unrighteousness will wind you up in hell, you know what receiving Jesus Christ will do and receiving what uh, his righteousness will do? It will save you. And receiving Jesus Christ and his righteousness is the evidence of your change of heart and your change of mind. The Bible says God made him, that is Jesus Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Christ becomes our righteousness, and we no longer look to ourselves for our own righteousness. You know why that is? We've repented of our unrighteousness. We've, rep we've repented of what we thought was righteousness, and we then recognize Jesus Christ has the righteousness. So, so the action of receiving Jesus Christ follows the repentance of sin and unrighteousness. And those two things are what Paul was preaching in Acts chapter 20, verse 21, when he said, repentance toward God 
I recognize God. You're right. I'm wrong. And faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. I realize that he's right. And he'll give me his righteousness in exchange for my sin. Yep. Yep, repentance really is necessary for salvation. It really is. And you can see it all through the scripture as you've seen uh, today. Now, now, after you're saved, uh, there's still going to be instances of repentance in your life that have nothing now to do with you getting saved because you're already saved. They have something to do with you getting in a right relationship with the Lord. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, for instance, uh, an entire church repented. Second Corinthians chapter 7 in uh, verses 9 and 10. The Bible says, Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us and nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Now, what Paul is talking about here is that he reproved the Corinthian church because they took a very lax attitude toward a very horrible sin being committed by a young man in the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And he instructed them what to do. They did it, and it hurt them. It was hard, but they did it. And that young man got the thing straightened out. And, the, and, and Paul said, I'm going to tell you something, man. This, the, this really resulted in a fabulous change in the church. When the, when the Corinthian church had to repent of being puffed up and not handling the sin in the church properly, you know what happened? They got the thing straightened out with God, and that thing bore a lot of good fruit. It was godly sorrow that worked repentance. And in verse 11, behold, this selfsame thing you sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge in all these things you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Paul said the way you guys changed absolutely cleared you in that matter. That's what the Lord's looking for. I mean, in our lives, after we get saved, listen, the Lord's going to show you some things, and he's going to want you to turn from those, and you're going to do it by repentance. Now, sometimes, I'll tell you what can happen. A Christian can go too far in his doctrinal error or in his sin and be taken captive by the devil. This is described in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I said 2 Corinthians, 2 Timothy chapter 2. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, you, you're going to run into some folks who, you know, really get fouled up in their Bible or get fouled up in sin. And when they do, we are, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25 and 26, we are in meekness to instruct those that impose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. You know what they have to do? They have to change their mind about the error that has led them into the lie, or they have to change their mind about the sin that has led them into that captivity and acknowledge the truth instead. That's right. They have to look at the thing that they've allowed in their lives and say, you know what? Up until this point, I thought everything that I was doing in this sin or everything that I was doing in this doctrinal error was okay. Now i got to back off of that, change my mind, and agree with God, this is sin, this is error. And when you do that, you may recover yourself out of the snare of the devil. If you don't, you will remain his captive. You're still saved, but you're held captive by the devil. In that error and in that sin, it is repentance, you see. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. I'll tell you, the way out of this, this problem on repentance is to get into that Bible and do what it says and change your doctrine and change your mind in accordance with the words of God. You see, repentance in and of itself is not a complicated doctrine. It is simply that change of mind that causes you to receive Jesus Christ when you realize that your own righteousness won't save you. And repentance 
is that change of mind that causes you to turn to the truth when you realize that you have believed a lie. It's that change of mind that results in you doing the right thing when you realize that you've been doing the wrong thing. I remember years ago, a lady came to me and she was tied up in the tongues movement and she wanted to know what the Bible had to say about it. I think she wanted to know my opinion, but I wouldn't give her an opinion. I said, let's sit down, let's open the Bible and turn to every reference in the Bible that talks about this particular uh, thing. She knew that I didn't agree with her, but we're looking at the Bible. When we finished reading everything the Bible had to say about that, you know what she did? She looked up to me and she said this, I've been wrong. I've been wrong. You know what that was? That was repentance. And you know what the Lord did? The Lord allowed her to recover herself by acknowledging the truth of the Scripture. It's an amazing thing. You know, if you'll do that with everything in your life, every sin in your life, every doctrinal error in your life, it's an amazing thing. Because what happens is, by that change of mind, the Lord allows that truth to make you free. And if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. You are, you are no longer held captive by the devil in that error or by that sin. Uh, there's freedom in it. But I'll tell you what, the, the, the key, if you will, that unlocks the door is repentance. It is saying to God, I know you're right and I know I'm wrong. That's what Job did. When he repented before the Lord, he basically had this attitude that God somehow or another was wrong for allowing him to go through the suffering he was going through, and that he was right, and as right as he was, God should have never allowed something like that to happen to him. Then he got a, a conversation with the Lord and heard the Lord speak in that whirlwind, and afterwards he said, you know what, I repent. I repent. I am vile. And he realized God is right. I was wrong. I'm telling you, there is such great liberty and freedom in, in repentance. And it is what really, truly opens the door for a person to realize his personal need or her personal need of Jesus Christ. And that's when they truly turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and receive him as their Savior. So they don't have to go and continue to live in, 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 um, in a lost condition as they were before they got saved. I pray this has helped you. I really, really do. Helped you personally and help those with whom you're dealing. Amen. You have been listening to The Unknown Bible, the radio ministry of Bible Believers Baptist Church in Corpus Christi, Texas. For information about our church, go to our church website at www.my3bc.com. That's my, the number three, bc.com. If you would like to contact us by telephone, our number is 361 241 6100. Bible Believers Baptist Church is a Bible believing church located at 1701 Rand Morgan Road. If you are not currently a member of a Bible believing church and you are looking for a church with an uncompromising stand on the words of God, come visit with us this Sunday or Wednesday. We would love to see you. Oh!